I'm Stephanie. Hi, I'm Angela. We are the Ink Mages. Join us as we discuss all things fantasy, world building, story craft, myths and legends, and of course, our own imaginative stories. Welcome to the Ink Mages podcast. Today we have a really fun episode. Stephanie and I will be discussing world building and how we've crafted our stories and even kind of what we learned along the way. We're really excited to have this conversation. Stephanie, you've got some amazing tips. So things to keep in mind when world building is to ask yourself these questions. What's the setting? What's the landscape? Are you writing high fantasy in a secondary world or are you doing magical realism that's taking place in our world? Perhaps you want to write in a historical medieval setting. Whatever you decide, just make sure to paint a picture and immerse the reader. Think about what makes your world unique. Is there a magic system? How does it work? What are the rules? Is there a cost to using the magic? How is it viewed? Is it widely accepted or do people fear it? Are there myths, legends, prophecies that exist in your world? And do the people uh, accept these prophecies? How does it affect their daily lives? What is the social structure? Is there a class divide? Are there racial tensions? Is there infighting? How does religion play a part? Did you create your own religions? Um, are there magical creatures in your story, like dragons? And we love dragons. <laughs> if so, what purpose do these magical creatures serve? Do they coexist with the humans or are they feared? Think about, is there a common language, especially if you're writing high fantasy? How do all these different uh, people groups in the kingdoms, how do they communicate? Um, what technology exists in your world? Is there a particular commodity that is highly valued? What is the currency? I also like to introduce fun idioms or sayings that characters say. Be creative. And uh, so for Angela, tell us a little bit about what things you were thinking of when you were crafting your world. Um, for me, honestly, I, you know, there was a lot of the world that was already just kind of built naturally in me because I was such a mythology nerd and I loved Arthurian legend. I also had lived in Ireland um, and spent some time in Wales and England um, and Northern Ireland. And those landscapes really were a powerful influence in the world that I was building. And um, we were discussing earlier, but I have more of a natural magic to my storytelling. And so uh, my magic system was already kind of set as far as the rules of what can happen, sort of, <laughs> inside a real world. I still got to use my imagination and create things the way I wanted them to, but I really wanted it to fit the mold of uh, mythological realism. And so I had just these landscapes that I'd already imagined, but I have to say when I first started writing my fantasy story, I hadn't fully understood yet what story crafting involved and all of the things that I needed to have in place to really tell a good story. So a lot of those things I had to learn along the way. Some of those things naturally came out of me because I was already an avid reader and I would suggest to any of you who are listening who want to be writers or writing a story, be a good reader. Because a reader, yes. uh, especially reading the stories that you already love, the kind of story that you're wanting to write, it will really help you know how to story craft. It will really help you know how to write your story and how a story flow should go. And it kind of gets um, the inspiration into your head a little bit. But for me, you know, being an avid reader and loving stories, I had kind of an idea of how a story should unfold. But there were so many things um, that I had to, I didn't realize I was setting up rules for myself. And I remember that was one thing that um, I really had to keep in mind as I was building my world. Like, what does this landscape look like? I was in the world of Ireland and England and Scotland, but maybe in the sixth century. So I had to imagine, okay, well, what would these landscapes that I've been to have looked like a thousand years ago? 
and you know how long would it take them to travel i mean one of the things you don't even think yeah. is you're, you're like researching how do i get my characters from one end of the map to the other how long would that take them by horseback assuming the weather's all good you know and yeah. i had to actually research in this century how long would it have taken them to sail how long of it how long would it have taken them to ride a horse you know things and actually that became one of my favorite parts of world building was some of the research like i even had to say what kind of trees would grow in the southern regions of wales you know again when you're building a world from scratch you can kind of dictate what grows where what's north and south what it looks like what the weather's going to be like um, and for me, I had to go, okay, no, I have to actually know what kind of poisonous plants would grow in this region that would be accessible or would have been brought by the Romans, like knowledge, medicinal knowledge that would have been brought from the Romans, um, having infiltrated England yes. for so long. You know, so all of those little questions that I had to ask myself in world building, like what would the ships have looked like back then? Um, you know, and, and a I lot of... Oh, a lot of that probably came as you were writing. You would probably yeah. get to a place where you're like, I need to know what the, uh, the the trees are that are native to this area. Or maybe a character ends up needing to know an herbal remedy. And so yeah. you're like, ah, oh, now I have to research. Yes. I even had to, like, there's this part where my characters uh, find a flower and it becomes significant to their relationship. And I had to be like, what kind of flowers grow in this area that they're in at this time of the year? And I didn't know that till I had gotten to that part of the story. Like what would have been a flourishing um, spring flower that just would grow naturally? And then does it grow in the shade? Does it grow in the sun? <laughs> As yeah, just super, super specific. I, I remember how strange it felt when I had to research poisons. You know, I'm like, I hope nobody's yeah. looking at my Google and thinking I'm trying to poison somebody. But I had to think, what kind of plants would uh, poison somebody? And then what would the effects be? Could it be remedied? Would it require magic for someone to survive this kind of mad, uh, this kind of poisoning? Or could there be a remedy or do we need, I remember at one point in my story, I had to, re I had to decipher that the poison that I was limited to using, it would have both maybe taken a remedy that maybe would not have fully worked and a little bit of magic because most likely the person would have just died. And then I had to think like, what color would this have been? Um, <laughs> you know, was it, it would have been green or yellow or orange, like when it was all crushed and made, you know, what color would the poison have been? And again, sometimes you limit yourself to too many rules because, you know, with storytelling, I think somebody told me once, they said, write what you know and make up the rest. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a common of, common expression. <laughs> yes, yes, just make up the rest, you know, but especially if you're in a historical world. So mine is definitely a fantasy story with um, lots of mythical um, fantasy creatures, but it is within a historical context. So there was a lot in my world building that I had to pay attention to. Uh, are there mountains in this region? Would there be a lake? You know, especially if they're going to be in water, would there have been water there um, during that era? You know, so there was just a lot of little research things I had to do, particularly for book two, because in book two, we go back to the future and I had to actually look at physical landscapes and what actually existed in the, the nation of England and um, world build with that in mind. And some of the research I ended up not needing to use. Sometimes it's just taking those small little details that are just enough, just mm -hmm. enough of a touch so that people who maybe know the area or the region, they kind of go, oh, she's been there before. Or, you know, she knows a little bit of something without going too in depth. Um, but that was definitely involved in a lot of my story building, as well as understanding what actually historically took place in those regions at that time. You know, this would have been a, the Romans would have just left um, I call it Pride Anne, but the land of the Britons. Um, and these tribes and Kimri villages would have been used to being protected by the Romans. And now you have the Saxons and the P Picts and the Gauls who were now invading the land and they were unprotected. So this is kind of the landscape of a kind of a weakened country. So I tried to bring in those aspects, but then allow room for my natural magic to grow. And like you said, adding in the prophecy, that was something that I knew from the start would be a huge part of my story. So as I was crafting it, I had to follow the lines 
of the prophecy and the history and all of the things that I wanted to roll into place. Wow. And you did a phenomenal job. I mean, your stories are so immersive. I do feel like when in book one, when Eleanor does make it to the past, it really does feel like 500 AD. And the way you describe the clothing, the attire, the way the like the castle is because it's not really a castle it's more of like a a roman-esque type of structure so the columns i instantly am not thinking like medieval castles so you just do a phenomenal job and i do have one question like some of the legends that you put in there like the ballads that merlin sings are those ones you made up or are they legit tales I love that. Can you say? <laughs> yes, you know, both. So you'll find that, um, so the Songs of the Bard are a big uh, part of my storytelling because in that day, the bards would sing and it wasn't like in the medieval era, era where you had bards who would just sing to entertain. At this point, the Druids were the bards and that was an important part of their history when they would sing everyone would listen it was storytelling but the storytelling was significant because a bard would never just sing a story to tell the story there was a reason there was some lesson or moral or something that the people needed to hear that would have been embedded in that story and that was another world building historical piece that i was pulling on really heavily because i thought that was such an interesting thing back in those days there was no written language or written history for the Welsh, they would have sung or told their stories and it would have been handed down orally over time. And um, one of those things also involved prophecy. So sometimes the stories would be told with an edge of a prophetic word. So I wanted to have those interwoven into my story and some of them I made up completely just with my uh, knowledge of folklore and storytelling that the bards would have told in Celtic mythology. I kind of took the ideas of how those stories were told and crafted my own. And then there were some, particularly there is one story of a man who comes from the other world and falls in love with a maid and he whisks her away to the other world. And then she ends up becoming enchanted and thrown out and forgets who he is. And it's this whole tale of of lost love almost romeo and juliet ish and that was definitely a real celtic tale I, oh wow i put my own spin on a lot of these that i include um even though there is a story about the silver bowl of healing that hangs from a tree that these knights um have to go find in order to restore oh. the land that was that story. a real Celtic story with real giants and green, um, a green kingdom and all of that stuff. But I took all of my knowledge of those stories and I put my own twist. I kind of let my imagination fly and kind of, you know, I think the original story didn't have like a good, a good warrior and a bad warrior. It was usually one good knight that passed the test. Um, usually it was like Gawain or something, someone who would have been Arthur's mighty men. Um, and this one, I took a more older outlook because this is a story being told to people who are currently, you know, living in Arthurian legend um, and put my own ideas of what the giant looked like. Um, I think in the original myth, he was had one arm and one leg and one eye and was this really awkward looking giant. And I decided mm, I'm not going to go that route. That might be a little too strange. Um, yeah. And then there's the stories of like the, 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 people coming from maybe Atlantis, maybe were the original fair folk that came to England and there's a story of giants and a magic harp. And that one is a mixture of my own storytelling and little aspects of Celtic stories that I had heard before, but it definitely is my own. So, you know, there's a little mixture interwoven in there. So anyone who enjoys those tales, if you ever want to ask, is this a real one or is this your own telling? You can always ask, but I have a lot of those intermingled throughout my stories. And they're, yeah, they're the best part, in my opinion. <laughs> Thank I, love, you. I love the myths, but I love the myths and legends. And so, you know, your, um, your myths and have inspired me to create my own. So that was something in the race of Arjun. 
because of all these little tales of knights that Merlin would tell, I was like, I want to have my own legend too. I want to have my own myth of uh, warriors from the past who did like incredible feats. Um, so of course I had to create one and put one in my story. And he plays a significant part. And so. I love that part of the story. <laughs> I totally lit up. I was like, this is amazing. <laughs> Well, you get the credit because it's inspired <laughs> by your by you. This is I, I love the quote you put online um, recently, and it was about you know writing our stories and it growing a community of authors and writers and friendships. And the the amazing thing is, as we read each other's stories, that's what's meant to happen. So we're supposed to be inspiring each other and helping each other <laughs> grow in writing and enjoying the whole genre of fantasy and sci-fi. It's it is a fun fantastic genre that really lets your imagination fly. And um, I so enjoy it. And I so enjoy being inspired by other authors and readers, which helps you world build. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And a big key to world building is to not throw all of this yes. at the reader at the beginning. So these are all those things I listed are good things to keep in mind. Um, you know, maybe as you start, but also as you get going. It's the key thing is just to start writing. Um, as you can see from what Angela said, she didn't have it all figured out when she started. She had a, already an idea of the landscape and the setting and the time in history that she was going to put her story in. So as she went through, she would research little bits and pieces and kind of uh, include that and weave that into the story. And um, with my story that I write, I, mine are completely high fantasy. They are secondary world. They do not take place on this planet. <laughs> so I get to kind of, I got to create whatever I wanted and didn't have to like limit myself to um, a history that's already been established. So I would have to kind of create my own. So uh, in The Conjurer's Curse, uh, in the beginning of the story, I do have a setting that is very like tropical, coastal, and there is its own culture there. And my character Rowan goes on a journey throughout the story and each place he goes to has a different landscape, has a different setting, has a different people group. And he is completely like new every time he goes to a different place. So that creates a challenge for me to like, how do I make each city, each kingdom stand out, make it different. And luckily I would already written a lot of this already in my adult fantasy series. So I had much of the world and the landscape and the political structure and the kingdom structure all mapped out. So it was mostly just getting my character to each place and having him interact with different people. And he gets to acquire information and knowledge as he goes. So in a way, it was a great way for readers to learn a little bit about the world as Roman does. So that way I'm not throwing all this new information at the beginning, but as he learns things, the reader would learn things. So that was a that was how I approached it and that story is to keep from just bombarding <laughs> people with, oh, yep, it's a secondary world. And you, here's everything you need to know about it. Like, no, your characters already exist in that world and they will have knowledge in the area that they are that's important to them. So you can sneak little bit uh, pieces that are important that the you know that the character needs to know um so that way it's in small increments and easy to digest that way mm -hmm.